this presentation is an active shooter presentation. I have edited it a little bit, and I have updated it since my last presentation. Um, unfortunately, we've had one too many events. Uh, however, this video, and what I show, is reality, and it can and it has the potential to re-traumatize somebody who has been through something similar to this. So with that said, if there's anybody here who's had an experience, uh, this can bring back any type of unwanted emotions. Uh, so when the videos are here, well, right now, if you think you need to step out, that's fine. During the videos, you can step out, or you can let me know if you have, or not let me know, but I just want to let you know that it can be traumatized somebody. I've watched some of the videos. I have too many videos, but they're not in here. And so unfortunately, there's some videos that are really beyond what, what a training requires. However, I watch them so I can get into the, the mode is what I'm going to present here today. It's to try to get you into some kind of frame of reference into understanding how important it is to be prepared. Uh, because sometimes we do the fight or flight, but there's always the freeze. And that's what happens, and that's what, I watch a lot of videos, and I, I found one from a student from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas School who does a five minute interview on what his experience was. And when I listen to a lot of the individuals who are victims of this, or survivors, let's put it this way, not the victims, but survivors, I understand that there are certain things that usually happen to folks which they freeze and they start to think. And to think in a situation like that costs time, and time could cost a life. So in my training, and some of you know my background, it's always been to react to things, not to think. When you react, you're doing something right away. When you think, you hesitate, and that right there can cost somebody their life. So when we get to a frame of reference that instead of saying, and this is the number one thing is, are those firecrackers? Too late. You're already thinking. You should just hear something and say, okay, and then just start reacting. And that's the purpose of this training. It's just like if I told you you have to wear your seatbelt, not because the popo is going to give you a ticket, but because it minimizes your chances of getting hurt if you get into a fender bender or a car crash, and it increases your probabilities of surviving an accident. And so with active shooter training, there's no guarantee that if somebody is in that situation that they'll survive, but if they're in a mode of survival, their probability of surviving increases. And that's the goal of this. Can I start? Yeah. All right. <laughs> and along the way, if there's any questions, please feel free to just ask me any questions. All right. So again, when you hear this, are those firecrackers? No, they're not firecrackers. It's right. It's not. <laughs> it's time to think. Like, what do I do? Too late. You should already know what to do. You should have some plan. And, and, and this is what I've practiced for such a long time. And this is what I still do. This environment where you work is a very relaxed environment. I worked here. And you come here, and the last thing you expect is for any type of violent situation. This is a, an educational setting. Where I work is a very active city. There's a lot of dangerous people where I work. So I go in there and I have to put my mindset that at any given moment there's going to be a fight, there's going to be something that's going to happen. Because I work with individuals who are not only mentally ill, but they also have a criminal background. So 
And those of you who work in corrections know what I mean. Right? All right, so the framework reference is the emphasis I made to be able to already have a plan in mind to have this mental imagery. And in psychology, a lot of you know what that is. All right. So you have a frame of reference when you have thoughts or feelings about an issue. And, and when I show you a video of one of the kids from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, he says something that's, you know, people see, see what happened and go, oh, wow. And then they move on with their life. And then that's it. But not the victims or the, survivor, the survivors there. You have a strong frame of reference when you have a personal experience or an issue. So obviously those who either were related or very close to uh, uh, what happened at, at the school, they do have a frame of reference. As a matter of fact, uh, the, my boss who works with me, she, her kids went to Mark and Stoneman Douglas. So obviously she has a very strong feeling with what happened over there. Difficult to have a strong frame of reference about an issue when you have no feelings about it. You have no personal experience or behavioral with it. You have never thought about it. And you don't believe it ever happened to you. And, and I came up with this, and I, want, and I made emphasis to bring it to the school, because I remember a long, long time ago, in a very long, long administration, I came up to somebody and I said, you know, maybe we should do this here. And then they told me, don't worry, nobody ever knows you're here anyways. Um, not here anymore. People know Alviso's here. But as I walked in today, they may not know Alviso's here, but they do know that that school's over there. So you have a school over there. People just walk right here, and anybody can just walk in. All right, so the purpose of this is because recent history shows that there have been increasing numbers of active shooter and workplace violent incidents. Even though nationally, you look at the FBI statistics, the crime has come down because we have better law enforcement, we have better technology. But it's like when an airplane falls, and flying is very safe, but when an airplane falls, you have two or three hundred people die, and it, it just makes the news. When one child gets killed in a school, it makes the news because in their mind, children should not have to go to school and, and be victims. But this has been going on for since at least the 60s. When Whitman got up at the uh, tower of uh, the school over in Texas and started shooting everybody. So we've had these active shooters on and on and on for years. Increase situational awareness and instill a sense of security within the workplace. I want to show you two videos, and these are reenactments, but they are videos that kind of really show you exactly what to do in these situations. Develop a realistic emergency and evacuation plan, and I have some in here, and hopefully you'll have some in place here. And one of the things that schools are doing, I know my grandkids, they do this. I just spent the uh, Thanksgiving weekend with them is that they have drills, uh, regular drills. And my 10-year-old uh, grandson, that they say they, they hide in the closet, they run, they, they do these drills. So they're prepared. Should this happen? Probably not. When I went to school, it wasn't an issue. We never thought of any active shooter. But this is the reality of today. That's what we have to do. And as they have drills there, I think every workplace or institution needs to have a drill. We have it at the hospital, too. We have drills there. And we have drills there after they did a mock scenario, and everybody in the administration got killed. It's a good thing I wasn't there. I was in the back. <laughs> All right. And understand the uh, law enforcement response and role. A lot of folks think that law enforcement go in there to help the victims. That's not their role. Their role is, since after Columbine, is to go straight to uh, the target, the person who's doing the shooting, and neutralize it. And the military has been training like that for many years, and now law enforcement trains that way. I'm just going to go over some of the past 
history of school shootings combined which was 1999 it's actually on April 20th 1999 which is the one that kind of changed the way we thought about these active shooters one teacher murdered 12 students 20 injured uh, students and one of the things about these shooters that I've also noticed is that amongst all the different topologies of mass murderers this Topology is called a missionary. It's a missionary shooter. It's, they don't just get up one morning and says, I think I'm going to go shoot up this place. They plan it. They have months of planning. But Bolton Harris spent nine months planning for Columbine. And their plan was to wipe out at least 500 students, blow up the place, and then kill themselves and go out in glory. And they picked April 20th for a reason. Because April 20th was Adolf Hitler's birthday. It was deliberate, it was robotic, and there was no fear. I'm going to show you this video of Columbine so you can see the perspective of some of the victims and the teacher I think it's the principal who we're in Columbine. School violence erupted again today. And with a vengeance. Columbine High in Littleton, Colorado, it has been a horror. In 1999, two high school students went on a deadly rampage, and the images seared themselves into the nation's collective memory. One of the worst school shootings ever, 15 dead bodies, still being identified. An American nightmare that too many schools know too well. Yet how much of our explanation for that nightmare was right? The entire country was confident that these two killers were two loner outcasts from the trench coat mafia who were targeting jocks in a revenge fantasy. None of that was true. Misguided perceptions of the Columbine shooting continue to influence us today. On April 20th, 1999, two students culminated months of planning by donning black trench coats and attacking their school. Armed with guns and an arsenal of homemade bombs, they terrorized teachers and peers. They had a couple of duffel bags at their feet, and we witnessed them pulling out what we assumed to be paintball guns uh, that later on turned out to be something completely different. My secretary comes in and yells that there had been a report of gunfire and bombs exploding. And so I ran out of my office, saw a gunman coming towards me. I remember hearing gunfire, and I remember glass breaking behind me. I was laying in, in broken glass from the, the window that had gotten shot out. All I could hear was the, the fire alarms going off, um, and then the gunshots at a distance. Okay, has anybody been injured, ma'am? Yes. Okay. Yes. And the school is in a panic, and I'm in the library. I've got students down under the table, kids. Heads under the table. We were all crouched under the tables, and we could hear the, um, the, the gunshots. We were all crouched under the tables, and we could hear the gunshots um, getting louder, and a couple times there was a big boom, and the floor would shake. On the floor! You better stay on the floor! Oh, God. Stay in line with me. Oh, God. The gun is right outside the library door. They came into the library. Eric leaned under the table and pointed his gun at me. I mean, I was like trembling under there like a little leaf. I saw the shotgun stare at the shotgun, and all I remember is it seemed like the barrel of the gun was the size of a cannon. As soon as that bullet entered my backpack and, and actually paralyzed me, shattering my vertebrae, um, that's when the pain set in. So there was like Eric um, on my, my right, and then um, Dylan was uh, up on my left. And I looked up at Dylan and I said, hey, Dylan. And he said, hey, man. And I said, what are you doing? And oh, it still like chills me how he was just like mm, killing people. The killers fatally shot 12 students and a teacher in less than 20 minutes. Then they turned the guns on themselves. 
12 kids died on my watch along with the teacher. In our lives, you're not supposed to bury your kids, and they were all my kids. Before the world had fully grasped what had happened inside the school, there was a scramble to make sense of it. We're getting coverage from four stations in the Denver area of a shooting at a high school. A still developing situation and one that looks like it's not going to be over anytime soon. Horrors like Columbine terrify us and we need an explanation. So even if we don't have an answer, we find one. And we find it really too fast. Two witnesses that we talked to on the telephone described them as members of the trench coat mafia. These are kids they claim routinely dress in black trench coats. Kids were watching this on TV. And also, it was the early days of cell phones. If they weren't seeing it, their friends were watching it on TV, calling them on their cell phones. Um, and letting them know. They were saying that, um, that they wanted to do this for their revenge um, for the school, I guess, because, I mean, they're such an outcast at our school. It was this little round and round feedback chamber. So when a kid goes on TV and says, oh yeah, they were outcasts, another kid who doesn't really know the, the killers well or at all, thinks, oh, oh, they're outcasts. Oh, I didn't realize that. Then when he's interviewed, he says they're outcasts. So you're, you know, you're contaminating the witness pool like that and speculation about a black-coated mafia and its supposed grievances ran wild. A gang that apparently hated athletes. It was all because people were mean to him last year. The trench coat mafia is more than just black clothes. These boys were dangerously strange. In a yearbook photo of some group members that was broadcast nationwide, neither gunman appeared. One member of the Trenchcoat Mafia, John Savage, said there was a good reason for their absence. Eric and Dylan were not, not at all a part of the things that we did as a group. They didn't hang out with us. They weren't Trenchcoat Mafia at all. And he says the media's description of him and his friends had little basis in fact. The Trenchcoat Mafia was like we were, we were, video game nerds, we weren't, we like, you know, sit around the table and, you know, play Dungeons and Dragons, you know, which is just about <laughs> the least dangerous thing you could do. It was a, a group of friends that had similar interests. Some kids referred to them as the trench coat mafia, but it was not that it was an organized club. But the explanation about outcast loners seeking revenge against bullies had the dual advantage of being both dramatic and familiar. What happened here at Littleton is a grotesque distortion of high school fears and rivalries involving cliques, the in-groups and out-groups that are a part of teen life in America. Author Dave Cullen spent nearly 10 years on his account of Columbine, researching police records, the killer's diaries, and their lives at the school. He said the boys had busy social lives and didn't seem motivated by bullying. There was lots of bullying at Columbine. It was a high school in America. Did it have anything to do with driving these two boys to murder? I cannot find any evidence of that. The killers directed their hostility toward the whole student population, placing propane bombs set to go off in the cafeteria at lunchtime. But the devices failed to detonate as planned. Columbine actually wasn't a successful shooting. It was a failed bombing. How much more indiscriminate can you get? Two big bombs to kill everyone who happens to be in that part of the building at the start of a lunch. Cullen describes the killer's motives as a cocktail of malice, self-loathing, and a craving for fame. Over time, they became something like a two-man cult, bent on making their mark on the world in one final act. It was a murder-suicide for both of them. For Eric, it was primarily a murder. For Dylan, it was primarily suicide. They took the tactics of terrorists and said, we can do the same stuff for our own aggrandizement. Eric talked about his audience in his journal and whether they were going to understand this. And there was one message observers seemed to take from the event immediately. School shootings have become a dark stain on American life. The phenomenon of kids turning guns on their schoolmates is all too familiar. And it's not just Littleton. We know that now. We've had lots and lots and lots of places. Columbine came after a string of school shootings in Oregon, Arkansas, and other states. Reaction to the Colorado massacre helped fuel a national movement towards school security. Parents across the country are demanding to know what their schools are doing to keep their children safe. 
Today, nearly half of public schools surveyed nationwide employ police or hired guards. At least 21 states mandate lockdown drills for school shooting scenarios. And millions of dollars have been spent on everything from metal detectors to anti-bullying programs. When people hear that somebody was caught planning a Columbine, the world knows what that means. More than a decade after Columbine, we're still struggling to figure out not only what causes school shootings, but whether or not we're seeing more of them. And coverage of the issue offers little clarity. School shootings are on the rise in America. I'm telling you, I have the numbers to show it. But there's actually very little consensus on those numbers. Experts say that the number is statistically unchanged since the 1990s. The number of school shootings in America has been uh, rapidly in decline over the last uh, decade. Researchers can't agree on a methodology for tallying up attacks. They make different decisions about whether to include non-fatal attacks on schools or foiled ones, or even on-campus suicides or gun accidents. And this leads to vastly different final numbers. We unfortunately tend to judge how frequently events occur by how often we hear about them. And that, of course, depends on, on news reports of, of these things happening. The death toll rises in an attack inside a school cafeteria. In Los Angeles, two students were wounded in an accidental shooting. A school shooting in Texas leaves two students injured. One statistic with a more clear-cut definition is overall homicides in schools. The Center for Disease Control regularly tracks those numbers and the trend line is clear. While they vary from year to year, school homicides are essentially flat across the decades. They're also extremely rare. There are over 300 shootings every day in the United States. How many of those occur in schools? Uh, almost none of them. And rare as they are, when school shootings do happen, there's some evidence that past attacks and intense media focus on the killers have helped inspire future ones. Song Hee Cho wrote that he was inspired by the Columbine killer's attack eight years ago today. The gunman, Adam Lanza, was obsessed with the 1999 Columbine high school attack. And some news outlets are beginning to take notice. We are not, uh, during this broadcast, using the name of the shooter. Often it seems that in history remembers the names of murderers and not the, the names of, of victims. It's good that school shootings are still shocking because it shows that they're, they're really rare. So I think it's important to, to kind of keep in mind that there are a lot of schools all over the world where no one's ever been shot. I could spend my entire life living in fear wondering when's the next attack or when's the next person going to do that, but that would be it. I'd be living in fear. I would be giving in to what they wanted to happen. Keys in your hand, you're ready to open. 
or maybe if it's dark, maybe you just go in a groove, right? So you already have a mindset for that. So this is the times that we're living. So with that same idea, it's about massive shootings that you should have an idea when you go into restaurants, when you go into the mall, when you go into the workplace. All right, he spoke about Adam Lanza. That was the uh, Sandy Hook Elementary School where he killed his mother. He went in with an AR-15. Now, if you're familiar with assault rifles, you should know, but if, if, you, if you're not, an AR-15 has a bullet, which is a, uh, it's a 2.23, and it travels at 2,650 feet per second, very fast. So if I had just a handgun here and I started shooting through that wall, it'd probably just stop there. But if I have an AR-15, it can go and probably even reach uh, the cafeteria. Because that's how fast it is. Because this is a drywall. Unless, of course, I have solid brick walls. But if it's drywall, it'll just go right through. So that's why in the combine, we, from these things, what we do is we learn so that we don't make these mistakes. And they're not mistakes, but it's we learn how to do better. To hide under a table is not really going to help you. To hide behind a wall like that could actually not save you because the bullets can go right through there. Uh, Nicholas Cruz had a high-powered rifle and it was going through walls and windows. So the idea is not just to hide, but to take cover. The topology of some of these, this guy was a loner. He had what was Asperger's syndrome, spent most of his time on a computer playing, violent video games, quiet to a depth which could not be penetrated. You can't really say just because you spend a lot of time playing video games, because a lot of people spend a lot of time playing video games. They play a lot of Call of Duty, a lot of different types of what you would call very violent games, but that doesn't necessarily make you an individual that would be prone to doing something like this. It's a combination of a lot of things. Colorado Planned Parenthood Active Shooter, November 27th. Shoot at odds with current medical practice. Again, missionary. He's got a mission based on whatever beliefs he has. Three dead, nine injured. Paris, France terrorist attack. Well, that was a terrorist attack, again, but you remember that 130 dead, over 100 inj injured. I think out of, there was 35 that's not mentioned in there, they were part of the terrorist attack. San Bernardino, uh, California, another terrorist attack. Uh, thought of as a workplace violence. Now, workplace violence usually is a disgruntled employee. And that's happened many years in the past. When somebody is fired, they become disgruntled, and then they come back to their workplace to take revenge. 14 dead in that incident. Wapaka Community College shooting in Oregon on October 2nd, 2015. Chris Harper Mercer left statements that he was depressed. And that's one of the characteristics that I find common amongst a lot of the shooters is depression. A, a feeling of loneliness, a feeling of being an outcast, uh, being, a, in their mind, uh, mistreated by people. Social media profiles suggest that he was fascinated by the IRA, Frustrated by traditional organized religion and track other mass shootings. Nine dead plus the gunman, nine injured. Trio Life Synagogue, Pittsburgh, October 28, 2018, not too long ago. 46 year old Robert Bowers posted anti Semitic messages online before the shooting, 11 dead. And here's another thing that is common across all these shooters is that they let people know how they feel. I can't remember where, but I wrote it somewhere in there that 30 people knew of the shooter and nobody said anything. They knew of all this behavior. So, again, it's not like somebody just wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to go do something. It's, it's planned and, and they post it. And so there are signs, which for us, what we do is we see something like this is reported or do something about it, at least. Um, 
Aurora, Colorado, the uh, theater there where James Holmes opened fire at the opening of that Dark Knight Rises movie, Fault that 70 injured. So even in a movie theater. And even after that, when uh, somebody did something, people got a little bit nervous. So what this starts to tell me is that everywhere we go, every public area we go to, we should be mindset to what if. And that's what I have found, that if I walk into this place here and I just quickly do a mental image of worst case scenario, what if something were to happen, and I just look around and I see the exits, I see where the thing is, and I just have a mindset, I play it in my mind, and then nothing happens and I go on. But if something happens, it's like automatically I function. I don't have to think and look. I already know it's there. That's what police officers do. They walk into a place and they kind of do this mental imagery in case something does happen so they can react, not have to think. They just react quickly. Las Vegas shooting, October 1st, 2017. Panic. A 64 open fire from the 32nd floor. Now, what can you do there? Um, 58 people killed, injuring more than 500. Again, he had a high powered rifle and he had a mission. And there was a lot of people that were injured in that one. Uh, Orlando, Florida, Pulse nightclub. <coughs> Martin went in there, started shooting people, 48 killed, wounded 53 others. And I know in that instant, a lot of people hid into a bathroom and they couldn't get out. And he went in there and he started shooting some of the individuals in that bathroom. So sometimes hiding in a place without an exit could also be fatal. So that's why I add to the run, hide, fight, the escape and survive factor. Because if you hide, you constantly have to think, I need to try to escape and survive. Marcus Stoneman Douglas High School shooting, February 14th. Nicholas Cruz, age 20, entered the school again. He had an AR-15, so that's a high-powered rifle. So he starts shooting, it goes through walls, it goes through windows. And again, to get wounded by a handgun, you can survive. When a bullet is traveling that fast, any part of the torso it hits, it enters with a small hole, and it exits taking out everything with it. It's just kind of like um, the gravity that pull, just pulls everything with it. So it's a very, very dangerous weapon. It's not a hunting rifle. If you kill a deer with that, you've lost your meat. So that's not a hunting rifle. It's just it's a, it's a weapon of war. That's all it is, just to kill. It's an assault rifle. And here's the other th factor. In six minutes, he killed 17 students. In all of these instances, in less than 20 minutes, they did all their damage. How long does it take for police to get somewhere? Could take 10 minutes, but he did it in six minutes. So you can't depend on police to come and, and say, that's why we have to be prepared. Because this is quick. Oh, this is the one. Reports indicate that more than 30 people knew about his disturbing behavior. And you've probably seen that in the news. A lot of the police officers went to his house. I think the FBI knew something about it. I'm not sure what happened. But it's not like he just woke up one morning. It's like this has been going on for a while. This video is one of the survivors, and he talks about his experience at the school. And there are some things that he says that I think are relevant, and I'll discuss it after we finish. I was sitting in fourth period, last period, uh, in the history of the Hall of Class Machine. This is classroom 1214 uh, on the first floor of the freshman building, and with about 20 minutes of class left, I heard the first shots that I've ever heard in my life of a gun, which was the AR-15. And uh, my class started to panic. Most kids ran to one side, uh, away from the door. Me and about eight other kids ran 
to the corner in clear sight of the door and moved a file cabinet to protect me and my classmates as best as we could and we all huddled behind it and um, I looked around the corner and of the file cabinet to see the shooter and then he, me and him made eye contact and he looked towards my way and then started firing rounds into my classroom and I just heard the window break. It was extremely loud. I heard, I've never heard something like that. It was the loudest sound I've ever heard and then I looked to my, um, my right side to see one of my friends, Nick Dorrett, was dead and another girl I know, Helena Ramsey, was also dead and then the girl next to me was skimmed with bullets a couple times and the two girls next to me were also both shot one in the back of the leg and I think one in the forehead was like skimmed and I called my I called the police I texted both my parents what easily could have been my last text to my parents I told them I loved them both and I sat there and pretty much just waited in complete fear for the police to come and after about 12 minutes on the phone with the police um, I heard cops in my hallway and we screamed they came towards my room and I looked around the corner to make sure it was cops and not the shooter and it was, and they finally came in. They, you know, got everyone who was injured out first, and then they got, they told us to leave, and they basically had the doors hold, held open. There was like six guys outside my door, six to 10 at least, like with holding their guns in like a row. And then there was a, a lot um, just in the hallways, and they just said run, run as fast as I could, run for my life, so I did. And I luckily got out that day and, you know, just in the hallway, it was. I saw two bodies. I had to step over the glass. There was blood, like bullets. The smell will never leave my my mouth, my like my nose. It's just it's so distinct, and it'll just be there forever, pretty much. He was just shooting through the window. He did not come into any doors in the in the school. If he did, it would have been way worse. Um, luckily, all the doors were locked. My door was locked, so he was just shooting through our. There's a window on every door, which is not bulletproof, clearly, and it's a. It's a tall, skinny window, and that's what he was shooting through, and he was just firing bullets through it. So I basically just saw his gun barrel kind of just firing rounds towards me and my classmates, and I just saw computers get hit, the wall, the window behind me get hit, um, and then my two classmates. I did know him. Uh, not immediately. I didn't notice it was him, but when I heard that it was him, I was not surprised it was him, nor pretty much as anyone who did know him was surprised. I went to middle school with him, and we all knew him since then. And I used to know his little brother who was, I used to be friends with. Well, I saw, I saw the face of the shooter, but it didn't look like him because I haven't seen him since like seventh grade. And he was also wearing glasses and a hat, so I couldn't really see, I couldn't really see his face. And I was really more paying attention to just the gun and I was in such shock. I wasn't even like trying to identify who it was. I was just like, like realizing it was real because a lot of people thought it was a drill. He actually ended up going back to the two classrooms that surround mine, room 1215 and 1216 apparently. That's as I've heard many times from students and the media. Um, and apparently he didn't come back to mine and if he could have, I was, but we were still exposed pretty easily. He could have easily gotten many more in my classroom because we hadn't moved. Like we were still in the corner that was completely diagonal from, from the door where is the only thing you could actually see through in that window. So I was in, I was in complete sight of the shooter as were my friends. I just want people to know like how real this is because it, it, it doesn't affect people really if, if they're not you know in that town and I just like it's such a real thing and it's been happening just more and more it's like not even surprising when something like this happens anymore and that's not how it should be like anywhere and I just want want people to know that like this needs to change and gun laws need to change and background checks need to change and schools need to be safer and you know stuff like that. Pretty much, just never forget this. Like this should be the this should should have never happened, but it already did, and it should at least be the last one. And I hopefully think it will be. Everyone who wasn't really too affected with this is they just go on with their daily lives. Like they still go to work, they're still going to school, and they're doing everything. But me and my classmates are just it's still with us, and it's never going to leave us. And it's just like it's a thing that I will have forever. I'll be telling my story forever. I got a tattoo for my classmates as did a lot of people, that, so it can never leave me. I don't want it to, but I, I, because it's, it's such a serious thing, and it's gonna be part of my life now. It's, it's just, it's a whole new normal. Like, everything before Wednesday was, was a, it feels like a different life than what it is now. I feel like I'm just, you know, I care about different things now. My priorities are extremely different, and that's how I think it always will be.
thought it was a drill. Oh, this is the uh, Thousand Oaks Woodline Bar and Grill. You know what's sad about this is that uh, one of the victims here was a survivor at the Vegas shooting a year before. He was a Marine veteran, um, killed 11 patrons, and police officer who responded to the shooting. He had posted this on Instagram. It's too bad I don't want to get to see all the illogical and pathetic reasons people will put in my mouth as to why I did it. The military veteran said in the post, fact is, I had no reason to do it. And I just thought, whatever the exp explosion is, life is boring, so why not? He's believed to have killed himself. Uh, there was at least 18 injured. Again, another missionary. So how do we define active shooter? An active shooter is an individual who actively engages in killing and attempting to kill people in a confined and populated place. Active shooter situations are unpredictable and evolve quickly. You see that in six minutes with the case of Nicholas Cruz. Typically, the immediate deployment of law enforcement is required to stop a shooter and mitigate harm to victims. Because active shooter situations are often over within 10 to 15 minutes, usually it's before law enforcement even gets there. Not always limited to the lone shooter, multiple suspects, such as in the case of Columbine, may be an immediate co-worker, previous customer, or planned terrorist attack. The incident may be well planned with numerous methods and weaponry, and most of them are well planned. And most of them have access to a lot of weapons. Some of the characteristics, they usually tell somebody now, they don't need to tell anybody, they put it on Instagram or any of the social media. Uh, it's planned. Most of the motive is revengeful. Revenge in their mind. There's a history of depression, 78% of them are suicidal at the time of the uh, shooting. The individual is different, and they're acting out their emotional needs. Some of the other topologies, abuse, felt abuse, socially isolated, anxious, aggressive as children, odds, they're odd kids, they're teased, bullied. Illusions of violence, excessive or intimidating reference to mass murder, intimidating weapon comments, paranoia, repeatedly accusing others of causing one's problems, and reasonable complaints. It's just a mirage of different factors that characterize them. The emotional need is to be heard, to be recognized, and a lot of it is to be infamous. And that's why some of the news now don't even want to give their name out. To have their unbelievable pain and rage acknowledged. Normal brain activity, proactive killers kill to achieve a thought out goal or robbery, even though I work with a lot of them, there is a rationale to the crime. They want to get something and they do the crime. There's a rationale to it. And a lot of the criminals, they don't want to end up dying, they don't want to go to prison. But the brain activity of these individuals is a response to real or imagined insults, such as these school shooters. So they have this perception that they have to get back at the world. And with that belief there, there's nothing that's going to stop them. And it's even worse because if they go in, Nicholas Cruz was not one of them. He ran out of the school. And I saw this um, animation of how he methodically went through every classroom and up through the different floors shooting and shooting, like he said, through the window. So he'd look through a window, he'd see the students in there, and he'd shoot right through that window. And then you can see how they did with little blue dots. And as the blue dots turn purple, that means that they, uh, they died. So it's kind of like a snake, kind of like these reptiles. I've got one of those at home, where they just think with the uh, older brain, just that brain stem. There's no cortex there. There's no impulse control. There's no... Uh, thoughts of what I'm doing is wrong. When you're in that situation, what can you expect? All of a sudden, you hear, like he said, the shooting, and you hear all this, and you hear the screaming. 
By the way, I don't know how they did this, but as I was doing a little bit of research to update this, there is actually a video on YouTube of one of the students at Columbine who videotaped as the shooting's going on with their phone. So I don't know how it is that you can have your phone going in light of videotaping and they even show, oh, look at the bodies, and they're just running out. Hyperventilation, accelerated heart rate, adrenaline rush, loss of peripheral vision, diminished hearing. You get that tunnel vision. You hear this and... No? Yeah. Still working. Okay. <laughs> and that's expected. And that happens. And it happens to even somebody who is trained. But when you're trained, and you have that mental uh, mind reference, you just react. You don't think. Because we all will hyperventilate. Our heart will start beating in any situation like this. That's normal. All right, so three phases of our mental disaster response. Denial, deliberation, decisive moment. The first one is denial. It's like, is this really happening? Uh, and that is a delay of action. Bang, bang. Is that firecrackers? Is this really happening? Is this a drill? You're wasting time. That delay of action costs time. Delaying action can cost lives. So that's why you have to react right away. That fugitive responsibility, a lot of people say, well, somebody will take care of that. And you just sit there. You'll see it if I have time for this video. You'll see how people just kind of like, well, somebody will take care of that. Or is that just a drill? You're just sitting there and you're wasting time. In situations, the biggest situation, we're looking at all this in cue and how to act. If you do nothing, if nobody does nothing, you'll do nothing. If they act, you'll act. So if all of a sudden everybody's running, then you run. But if everybody's sitting, then you sit. So it only takes somebody to just start and react, and then everybody follows through. Once we pass the denial, like, oh my God, something's really happening here. Now we make a decision of, what do I do? You're still wasting time. What do I do? You should have kind of like, this is what I know I'm going to do. Fear enters the equation, and fear is an emotion. And emotions can take over judgment, and emotion can freeze a person if you're not mentally prepared for this. Side effects of stress, ability to think seriously, is impaired. Vision narrows, time distortion, auditory exclusion, fine motor skills. That's, that's the freeze. You're like, oh my god, what do I do? If you've never been in a situation like this, I would expect, I mean, that, that it could happen. It's like, oh my god, what is this? What's going on? I've seen the expression of people, all of a sudden they see something I'm like, really? I see it where I work, but all of a sudden there's a fight that breaks out, and some of the technicians are like, What's happening here? No, what's happening is they're having a fight. You've got to do something about it. They just freeze for a moment. Because they've never been involved in that. Or all of a sudden, they get hit. Did I just get hit? Is that real? Think through events before a disaster. Plan your response and practice your response. The best way to get the brain to perform under extreme stress is to repeatedly run through rehearsals. I'm sure we're good at one rehearsal. Here it is when hurricane comes. Put up the shutters, get all you know, the water, the generator. The I mean, we have, we got the drill packed down. At least, I know we do. I'm sure you do too. So we have that drill. And then it passes and then we're back to normal. Alright, once you pass all this, it's time to act, be prepared. This is a quote, the one thing you don't ever want to do is to have to think in a disaster. You have to just react and do something. I think we're prepared. Uh, I'm not sure if you were uh, here during Hurricane Andrew. Maybe some of you weren't because it's a long time ago. But that's something that we weren't prepared for. But we reacted to it. Holding that door down so it wouldn't shit. Putting the sofa there, just putting everybody holding that door. All right. So we reacted to that. So, so what do you do? Being prepared is the key. 
is to have a plan. This is where you work. You spend most of your time here. You spend a lot of hours here. This is a place to have some kind of plan in place. Establish policy, protocol, standard operating procedures, realistic emergency evacuation plans by location. So you should know where all your evacuation plans are. There should be maps around the area. Whether you're in a classroom, whether you're in your office, always have a plan. Of, if I have to evacuate, which way do I go? If something's happening here and this door is blocked, what do I do? Kind of just think about those things. As you're at your desk, take a couple minutes to think. If something were to happen now, what would I do? And if you just think of what you would do when you play it in your mind, you're already prepared. Because when it does happen, you'll just react and you'll do it. You don't have to start thinking like, where do I go? Identify strategies to exit the building. Primary, secondary exit plan, four plans, exit doors, identify objects. A lot of the uh, schools now, and I think you're going to hear, it's just making sure that you're able to lock the doors. That's a good thing. You can lock your doors. You may have to skip the videos. So the role of law enforcement is to go straight to the threat and neutralize it. And they may be walking past victims. Hey, I need your help. That's not what their role is. Their role is to go straight to the threat and neutralize it. And then, can you imagine the first six minutes. The first couple of minutes where it seemed like it's forever, it's chaos. You don't know what's going on. The law enforcement gets here. How does he know that this person or this person, or well, who is the active shooter? Who is the threat? They don't know. So that's why you always see everybody walking with their hands open. Not like this. Because this is dark. And this could look like a weapon. So it's nothing in your hands, hands open. It's an understanding. Remain calm and follow the officer's instructions. Put down any items in your hands. Immediately raise your hands and spread your fingers. Keep hands visible at all times. Avoid making quick movements towards officers. And don't stop and ask officers questions or help. They're there to do a job, is to neutralize the situation. Later on, after the whole situation, police officer will come to all the survivors and witnesses, and then they'll start asking questions. What do you do if all of a sudden there is an active shooter? Well, everybody has cell phones. You can call 911 right away. Describe a suspect, number of types of weapons, suspect direction of travel, location of conviction of victims. One of the good things that we have today is that everybody has a cell phone, so everybody can just call in and give that information. I know there's apps that um, you can actually activate it, and everybody in the school actually has kind of like an alarm. That's something that IT can work on. Yep. Announce an active shooter incident using the intercom system. This is something we had in the in the office I used to work before. Uh, police station, if anybody ever came in and there was a threat, we had a code word, and we had a loud system. Uh, yeah. And so if we heard that code word, we know that there was a threat in the building. And that's a good idea to have also. Maybe not throughout the entire school, but maybe in your office space if you have a code word uh, that if somebody hears it, you know there's a threat in the school. All of the active trader shooting, uh, active shooting training talks about run, hide, and fight. Because the first thing you do is you run. You want to get away from the threat. But if you can't run, because a lot of times running, if you're running from them, you could get shot. So the next thing is to hide. And to hide is really to find cover. Maybe behind something that will, you would think this will hold bullets. The last thing you want to do is to fight. And there are students there who actually grabbed chairs and threw it at uh, the shooter. So if you have one shooter and you have 20 students and each student grabs a chair and throws it at them, you have a fighting chance. 
because it's about survival. It's about reacting to it, not thinking. React to the situation, and you escape. You want to get away from it. You don't really want to charge it. But during your escape, you want to run, hide, take cover, and then when you can, continue to run and hide, run until you finally get out. And if push comes to shove, then you have to fight and survive. I started 10 minutes late, so I'm going to do this one video and finish a little bit later. Let me see if I can get it. You're about to watch a video, video about a disturbing subject, how you should respond in an active shooter situation. An active shooter is an individual shooting at people random in a populated area. The likelihood you will ever encounter this type of situation is extremely remote. In fact, you are more likely to be struck by lightning than be the target of an active shooter. And many people just want to know what they should do if it were to happen to them. Listen for the messages of get out, hide, fight. Who knows? One day, it could save your life. There are many partners who work together to make your campus safe. The likelihood of an active shooter occurrence on your campus is extremely remote. However, when the unthinkable happens, it's essential to be prepared to act, just like you would in a fire. Every second counts. Not sure if that's gunfire? What else is happening? Check for crowd reactions, shouts, screams. Trust your intuition. If it sounds like it could be a gun, react as though it is. Planning could save your life. Be familiar with your environment. Knowing your options ahead of time means you can act with a clear mind when fear and adrenaline kick in. Scan and assess your situation. Consider your options. Act. Active shooter situations are unpredictable and evolve quickly. You will need to react fast. If you believe you can escape safely, do so immediately. When you are safe, call 911. There's a shooter on campus. People coming out. Where's the shooter? I think he's in the library. Okay, get behind our truck. Follow the directions of police. Choose a safe exit. Don't attract the shooter's attention. Protect yourself first before helping others.
find a secure room or space. Shut the lights. Turn off the lights. Everybody Cover windows. Get out of the line of fire. Lock the door and barricade it if you can. Someone's shooting. We're going to lock down. We're going to be safe. Don't worry. Improvise. Stay out of the line of fire. Get under desks or behind tables. Mute your phone. Be quiet. Wait for police to come to you. Turn off the lights. Lock and barricade doors. Stay out of the line of fire. Be quiet. Please remember, we're not going to be in this When you can't get out or hide, your last resort may be to fight. You, turn off the lights. Everybody. Whether you are alone or with a group, be ready to fight for your life. Commit to aggressive action. Mentally prepare yourself to physically fight. It would be a fight for your life. It's your decision. Disarm and incapacitate the shooter any way you can. Improvise weapons from nearby objects. Commit to an aggressive physical attack. Stop the threat. If you are safe in your hiding place, stay there and let police come to you. It's the police service. Announce your presence. Remember, the primary duty of police is to stop the shooter and then tend to casualties. Okay. What we need you to do now is just follow our direction. Everything's going to be okay. We're going to get you to exit the room, nice and slowly, one at a time with your hands. Do whatever you can to get through this. Odds are you will never face the unthinkable, but if you do, keep the odds in your favor. Okay, you next. So, the run hide fight. Run if you have an escape route. You saw how just run and try to get out. You have to know where your escape routes are at. Just like in the airplanes, first help yourself before you can help somebody else. If you can't run, then you find a hiding place. And hiding places is that you already have uh, an idea what is a good hiding place? Wherever that may be, in your office, classrooms, or wherever the um, location on campus. And remember the hiding place has got to be somewhere where you can think that it's covered, not just hide behind a curtain. You hide behind that curtain, that's not going to work. It's got to be covered, something that you think, well, this can hold a bullet. Last resort is to fight. If it's just you alone, or if it's a group of people, remember in the uh, airplanes of 9-11, one of the airplanes, they decided to fight even though they didn't make it, but I think they saved a lot of lives because that airplane was headed towards the White House, was it, or Capitol Building? So they saved a lot of lives, although they sacrificed theirs. Have a survivor's mindset, not a victim. So you're not a victim, you're a survivor. 
And having that mindset can get you through any situation. Having the mindset of, I can do it. Having the mindset of, what if? What do I do? And I would say that's, or you may say, well, I don't really want to live that way. It's just the reality of life. The reality of life is that anything can happen at any time. Has it happened in my lifetime? No, I've looked for it because in my previous job, that's what we did. We, I ran towards what was happening. But I've really never been, well, I can say I've been a victim. I've been robbed several times. But I haven't been a victim of violent crime. But that's not to say that it can't happen. And sometimes we think that way. Well, it never happened to me. What? It's not going to happen to me. We don't know. Over there at that mall, we've had several scares several times. And I know somebody that was there, and everybody runs. And it gets to the point now that I think everybody is cognizant of this. And when something happens, people, I don't think they overreact, but they're reacting to it because of all this media attention. But I think it's a good thing because that way we're not caught off guard. Following an incident, uh, human resource department ensures to the extent possible that all employees are accounted for with the roll call, emergency contact information, uh, employees will be used to notify families, activate the disaster behavioral health response team, and that's very important because after that there's a lot of trauma and there's got to be a lot of debriefing that has to take place after an incident like that. Uh, the decision to allow evacuate staff back into the building will be made by the provost or designee in consultation with on-scene law enforcement. So the takeaway is understand the school's emergency plan, your emergency plan here at the school, but also don't just limit it to your work environment. Use this everywhere you go in all different locations. I work with somebody who has a plan at home. So he has a plan at home between him and his family. He says, what if somebody breaks into a house? You're at home, and all of a sudden you have somebody who broke in. What do you do? He has a plan, right? His wife has a plan, the kids, so he trains them like, all right, if somebody breaks in right now, what do we do? So he has a plan to do something. It's a good idea. Be familiar with the buildings and evacuation routes. routes. Identify primary and secondary staging areas. I'll show you a map about that now. Know your capabilities. If you can't run for whatever reason, then you may have to just hide. Uh, maintain situational awareness. Always be aware of your environment. When you're in a school, and this is a fairly small school, you should be able to know everybody. And when there's somebody that's strange you don't recognize, I would always confront in a very friendly manner. Like if you see somebody in the hallway and you don't know who they are, it says, uh, excuse me, can I help you? Is there something I can do to help? Because you don't know who they may be. Somebody, I'm not sure if they can just walk into the school. The use of ID badges is a good idea because at least if you don't know who they are, new employees, at least they have ID badges. I know we have ID badges where I work. Report suspicious behavior or possible threats. And any time, and I know we've done that in the past when I was here, if there's any suspicious behavior, or whether it be an employee or whether it be a student, it needs to be reported to HR. I don't know if it's changed, but that's the uh, map of your, there. So know all the routes. This is an arrow view, and then you can have rallying points. So where do we meet? If we run, either there's a primary over up towards the parking lot or over towards the rear, but you have some kind of a plan. It was, this is where we rally. This is where we meet. Because it's a good idea that after the incident, then um, it's easy for HR to have an accountability of who's out or who's missing. To remember that the mindset is to react, escape, and survive. When you escape, you run, hide, and the, open, and the last resort is to fight. Now, these are some of the individuals that were initially involved with this. Your, your provost, Carmen Vasquez, which is HR manager, Louis Barreto, finance, and Irma Barone, also. 
That's me. Never give up. Is there any questions that I can answer? Any concerns? Any feedback? If there's anything you take away from this, is just to be mentally prepared for the worst. That's it. There is no book or any type of training that would say, this is how you do it, this is going to guarantee you that things are going to work out fine. So all you can do is know what's happening in today's society and be mentally prepared. When I said that I was a victim is when I let my guard down. I was in Europe one time in Amsterdam, and I was on vacation, so I'm a terrorist. So I didn't lock my car, big mistake. And I parked in that street in Amsterdam, and I even looked at the side street, it was full of glass, and I said, oh, they must steal a lot around this place. <laughs> this dumb tourist just goes and has fun. When I get back, guess what? They stole everything we had in the car. So I let my car down, and that's why we become victims. Not that a victim is at fault, but sometimes when we let our guard down and we don't realize things, we can become vulnerable. So it's always be vigilant, always think of what worst case scenarios are, and if we're mentally prepared, I think uh, it increases our probabilities of surviving. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's a good question. I discussed that with my stepdaughter, who is a teacher in the first grade. She doesn't want to have a gun. To have a gun, you should really be very proficient with it. So, if you're not comfortable with it, I don't think it, it's effective. If, um, if somebody came into the classroom and you were proficient with it, maybe they have a fighting chance. Uh, so, you know, I can argue on both sides of that. I can argue, one, that we don't need guns in the school, uh, but if somebody, if somebody had a gun in the school, I would hope that they would be very proficient and trained with that weapon. Not just going to a weekend training, this is how you have to use the gun. And I wouldn't impose it on somebody that I really don't want to have a gun, I don't feel safe with a gun, and I wouldn't do that. So with that, I think we should have, maybe not the teachers, but maybe custodians, look like custodians, but maybe former police officers, former military, that are either security officers that may be armed. That could help. But even with that said, that's not going to stop the active shooter from going there. And by pointing that gun, he'll be the first target to go. So the active shooter comes in, he sees a gun, he's going to shoot. So I don't know that that's actually going to minimize it. Uh, because they're missionary, and they have a mission to go in there to do the damage. So not, it's not like they say, oh, there's people with guns there, so let me not go there. Because he's already thinking, he's not thinking. He just goes there and... It's like this Marine went into that bar. How many people are armed in the bar? Probably many of them. But just went in there and started shooting. Uh, so I, I don't really think it's going to make a difference. And then I also think that, uh, you know, knowing that law enforcement's uh, goal is to get to the heat of the action, uh, if you have a teacher with a weapon, you don't really know if that's just like the active shooter. You don't know if it's a teacher. I know with my training, uh, with weapon degree, uh, you're not assured of what you're doing with it, it's very obvious that the person could take it and turn it on you. If you're not, you know, it's, 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 it's more to just saying, I'm going to be a shooter, I'm going to try to protect it. It's, it's a lot of... And that's a good point, because if I'm a police officer, I'm coming in there and I see you with a gun, I'm going to think, well, you're probably the shooter. So, and then the active shooter training that the police do, there's this thing that you wear that put on you, and it says police. So, now you have to be prepared to carry this with you, to 
carry the gun, and if all of a sudden you're going to defend yourself, now you've got to wear something that identifies you as a law enforcement. So uh, it's probably best not to even have the guns in there. It's probably best to have the security on the outside, a good barrier, and then everybody inside just be mentally prepared to deal with it. I think also the schools need to have more of the, uh, the escape practices, the drills. Like I remember when I was in school. The, the drills school. are important, just like the fire escapes. And for the students and the teachers, whoever to hear what the gunfire sounds like. Because it's definitely the fire does not sound like a firecracker. But you don't know what you don't know. I know uh, when I was, uh, I worked with Metro Data a lot, we went to a lot of schools and we did a lot of mock scenarios and a lot of the students volunteered. So we did that so they could get prepared. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's very good drills. Yes? So going back to what they just said, <coughs> my daughter was in LaSalle High School and I think after the Marjorie Stoneman incident, they came in, the police came in and did mock for a whole week every day and take like fake shotguns and shots and a lot. A week ago, two weeks ago, my daughter was at Pebble Park at a Columbus football game. And someone said, they heard her something like a little shot. And she totally did exactly what was told of her. You run away from the shots. And it ended up being that there was someone there with a gun, but it wasn't a shot that had fired. But it was amazing to see how everyone reacted the right way. You were mentally prepared, yes. So having drills is, is important, it's something that I suggested and it's something that uh, HR could do if they wanted to, something that you coordinate with your local police department. I know that uh, the department I used to work for, they have active shooter training for police, but they can come to the school and actually do these mock scenarios, which could be a lot of fun too, and very edu educational. Yes, ma'am. Has anything been planned or done as far as like a regular civilian to obtain a, a weapons, automatic weapons? I mean, of course they can't anyone who can really reload the weapon. Yeah, here's the funny thing. Yeah, the laws need to be, I believe in people having guns to protect themselves, but the law has to be, the guns need to be in the right place. Um, I go to a gun show, and as a law enforcement officer, and I buy a gun, I gotta wait five days before I get that gun. Yet this guy here goes on the weekend, get your uh, concealed weapons license, and he can buy it and take it home that same day. That doesn't make sense. So I think that needs to be changed. I think that somebody who has buys a gun, I don't care if I buy a gun, do a background on me, do a psychological assist, well, we don't do a psychological. <laughs> it's probably not a good idea. <laughs> but we don't we want to make sure that whoever buys a gun is somebody who's mentally stable. And to do backgrounds, I'm all for it. I don't think they, they don't belong in the wrong hands. So I don't think that the, the laws are or the process is not perfect. And really here here in South Florida you don't even have to go you can just buy a gun anywhere. You can buy a gun in the street if you want to. So it's what do you feel about IRAs and how the hunter uh, and uh, you know, I know we don't need those kind of weapons to hunt because like you said, it destroys the harvest. So what do you feel about IRA and what you're saying about some of those weapons are just fun to shoot at a at a, at a range of the power, I guess maybe it's just guys like that power weapon, women like that power dudes just have like an automatic weapon, and shot automatic weapons, you shoot a 50 caliber, and it's just, it's just fun to shoot at target. Uh, but you're right, it's not a, it's not a hunting rifle, and then, uh, unless you're an aficionado and you go to a range and you shoot where you're supposed to shoot, there's, there's no point in having it. Now, some of these AR-15s, they go for $2,000, and so, uh, when you get them really cheap, it could also be an investment and you can sell them and make money off of these guns. The problem here in Florida is that I buy a gun and I can just sell it to you. Just, there's no transactions, and there's no register, you don't have to register your gun or anything like that. So. 
You're welcome. And get a flash. So we can't control that, but we can control us and how we react to the stuff. Yeah. All right. Y'all have a great day.